Okay, welcome back to Foundations of Preaching. Um, hope you all are doing well, and uh, I'm excited about today's course with Dr. Greg Kilmeyer. Um, he'll be with us uh, here shortly. There he is. I see his face. Great to see you, Dr. Kilmeyer. Dr. Kilmeyer is actually the Associate Dean for the School of Fine Arts and Communications um, at Bob Jones University and a professor for the Division of Communication. Uh, he has a PhD in communications from the University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana, and um, Dr. Kilmeyer has a lifelong passion for international and intercultural communication. He has uh, lived abroad and he has uh, spent um, several months of a year abroad for uh, really decades and um, has um, a vast amount of uh, um, experience with intercultural communication and um, especially in being with the Eastern European team um, with with over 25 countries so we're we're really ecstatic to be having a part of this class he is a gifted teacher uh, a brilliant communicator and um, and a dear friend for us and um, I'm excited about having a someone who is good at communications in a foundations of preaching class. Sometimes that's an element that is missed. And I really feel it is so significant for us and that we can learn and, and, and have so much to learn from him in regards to this so that we can communicate the gospel and communicate um, the scripture more carefully and articulate it um, in a way that is uh, really connecting with our hearers. Uh, Dr. Kilmeyer, um, although he's, um, uh, you know, a communicator. Um, he has a PhD in communications. He actually is a preacher. And I have heard him preach scores, um, if not hundreds of times. And he's a gifted preacher and the Holy Spirit has used him countless times in people's lives, including my own. So it's welcome. Welcome to have you and uh, great to have you uh, Dr. Kilmeyer. And let me, if you want to just go ahead and turn your mic off, or turn it on, it is off, and it's probably in the bottom left corner. You can just hit Got it. it. There you go. And the time is yours. Thank you. I really appreciate the kind remarks, Dr. Oberlin. And uh, Kevin and I have been good friends for a long time, and we had many happy times together with the mission team trips that he just mentioned. And so I want to share with you my love and respect. Thank you for the work that you are doing in the Lord's ministry, and it is a delight to be together with you this morning. Brother Joel and I were talking about how to begin our topic today, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit of my own testimony of how I got saved and how uh, I came to love preaching and to work with the Lord's people. When I was a young, young, about the age of five, my parents were converted. They were not believers when I was born, and they lived a normal life that sinful people live. They were good parents, but they did not know the Lord. My mom heard a radio preacher, a man on the radio who himself had been converted partway through his life, and he was a hard man. He sinned a lot, and when God saved him, he knew that he had been completely saved by grace. So that man's influence on my family has been profound because my mom got saved. My dad soon after followed the Lord. And so in that sense, I grew up in a Christian home. But every person is a first generation Christian because each one of us has to personally meet the Lord. And so I met the Lord through the good Bible preaching and teaching of small churches in Wisconsin where I was growing up. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that God's punishment on sinners was just. And I knew that God was reaching out to me, but in my heart, I was running away from him. And through his mercy, he kept on reaching out to me with verses like John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life with the verse about Jesus being the mediator between God and men, and I had received a little booklet, a gospel tract, showing the bridge between God and man, the cross of Jesus Christ. And finally, the Lord reached out to me with a sermon on hell, and I knew that was what I deserved. 
and I called out to the Lord and I said, Lord, please save me. And he transformed my heart. He forgave my sins. He gave me new life. And about five months ago, my 78-year-old mother passed away and went to be with the Lord. We had a celebration rejoicing that God had redeemed her and that her life's influence had been so profound on us all. And I am counting on the resurrection. That is what motivates me every day, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. He is alive, and he is coming back to get us. And we might be with those who go up together, or we might be those who are waking from sleep. But either way, we are alive because of Jesus Christ's resurrection. So that's what motivates me both as a teacher and preacher of the Bible, and also every day in the classroom at Bob Jones University. I want my students to find that their relationship with Jesus Christ is what motivates everything that they do, because they know what they are doing lasts for eternity. And that is the joy that we all share together. My, uh, as Dr. Oberlin pointed out, I've uh, been a student of public speaking for quite a long time, and also a student of preaching, and I've been privileged to listen to many of the world's great Bible teachers and preachers. So a lot of what I would say today comes from both of those uh, elements in my life, and I hope that we can share together and really find some encouragement today in the Lord. But again, I want to express my respect to you and thank you so much for participating in this seminary session. Uh, Brother Joel, do you want to do a QA like we talked about? Shall we talk together with some questions about communication and see how that goes? That sounds great. That sounds very good. Um, just a comment here. You probably, if you went on the Moodle page, you, excuse me, I'll insert this comment as well. I am in a I am in a coffee shop. If you hear a soundtrack behind me, it's not a soundtrack for this class. Um, it's just the music. So, I, and this would not be my choice for a soundtrack anyway. Um, anyway, with that word, there are, were some videos that we put up on the Moodle page. I hope you got a chance to take a look at those. Uh, I think they were, I think they're really interesting. I think they're very helpful and engaging, um, but they're not perfect. So there's the, the part of the reason we put that in there is to cause us to engage and think about a little bit about those. I want to talk about that in a bit, but I'm going to do this first. Um, and it's a, a question that, that I just want to do in connection to introducing Dr. Kielmeyer. Okay, question here. Uh, Dr. Kielmeyer is primarily a communications professor, okay, in terms of what he does academically or what he does professionally. Now, in terms of personally, he's an excellent preacher and has had significant experience preaching. Um, not just here in the in the U.S., but across the world uh, in in other languages. Okay, preaching in German um, quite a bit in German, and then all across Europe, and uh, significant amount of time spent in Europe. So a lot of lot of months and actually years accumulated. Okay, so that's him. Um, but a question to ask is just why did we, you know, inviting a speech teacher or a communications teacher for a preaching class? What do we think about that? And what I'm asking Dr. Kielmeyer really here is how would we view kind of the relationship between preaching and communication? How are the two different? How are the two the same? How are the two overlapping? And any thoughts about that, these disciplines and how, how they can help each other? Any thoughts there? Well, first of all, I want to start off with where communication came from. And it came specifically, directly, and personally from God. And we find this in the first chapter of Genesis, that God is the God who reveals himself through communicating with his people. Communicating, speaking language is a direct gift from God. So Genesis 1 tells us, and God said, let there be light. And then we find that Adam was created communicating with God. Adam did not have to learn language. We don't know what language was that he was speaking, but we do know that Adam, the first day that he was alive, was able to communicate with a complete functioning language. And that was God's gift to him. And Adam deployed that gift as God's delegate in the creation. In other words, the fact that Adam named the animals was not simply giving them cute names for pets, like Fido and Fifi and other names that we might give to an animal. Ad Adam was exerting God's delegated authority to command the creation with language. And so we understand that this is very different from the secular or atheist view of language. 
because secular people think that everything evolved, including language. And they think that early humans grunted and groaned and eventually developed common sets of sounds. But that is completely opposite of what the scripture clearly shows us, that Adam was a communicating person at the very beginning, and his most important communication was with God personally. Then God created multiple languages at the Tower of Babel, and we take that to be a literal historic fact and not simply a cultural myth. And so because God is the originate, originator of language, we can be confident that language can be reliably used. Furthermore, because God gives languages to different people groups around the world, translation is necessary. And at certain times, speaking in different languages was a direct gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't intend to go into the theology of speaking in tongues, but only to notice that God gives language ability and that God gives translation possibilities. In other words, meaning is reliable. And so we can use language confidently. Communicators then, as preachers, are primarily communicators of God's words. And the study of communicating words is not a secular activity. It is a very Christian and spiritual activity. We love the words of God. We share the words with other people. And through this, we glorify God because his very nature is to communicate himself with words. That's a good start. The, the study of communication has been practiced by cultures around the world for thousands and thousands of years. But as we look at the history of public speaking, we usually start with ancient Greece because of the famous philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and during the Roman Empire, the many other teachers of public speaking followed in the same footsteps. We know that Paul was aware of these people and their influence on Greek culture was evident to everyone. But Paul said, I do not use the wisdom of man's words. And he did not follow the vain philosophies of men. And so when we are talking about the studying, study of preaching or homiletics or public speaking, we always have to keep in mind Paul's criticism of the way that the secular world practices public speaking and rhetoric. Their goals are usually to manipulate and to deceive. And even if they have noble goals, they have completely faulty philosophies of life. And to read Greek philosophy and Greek myths is to find out how dark they really were. And Paul summarized the entire ancient world as darkness. And we have been translated into the kingdom of light. So as we study public speaking, we may encounter the philosophies of the world, but we always filter them with the recognition that God is the creator of communication. And that we follow his example in the Bible as opposed to the teachings of the world. That's great. Really, really helpful. There's, um, there are two thoughts that are going on in my mind at the same time, and they're actually intention. So it's like a dialectic thing going on. Um, okay, here's the one side. Uh, when you say some of these things, I, I, because I'm at currently in North America, I just, it makes me think very much about what I, I recognize in my culture, particularly in my Christian subculture, a desire to fit into what the culture is thinking or cultural relevance. And so you try to recreate preaching or proclamation to basically be like a TED talk or, you know, to somehow to engage people to be funny, interesting, and so forth. And, and that shifts the whole balance of your focus away from what you're actually supposed to be doing, which is communicating a message that has been given to you. Um, it's not actually the message does not belong to you. Um, so that's the one side tension. Okay. And then the opposing side tension that's going on at the same time in my head 
is that one of the things that I found most helpful in my undergraduate education uh, of all the classes I took, speech and, and, and communication classes were so helpful for me for what I do right now. Um, and, I, you know, I was a Bible major and that was my focus and so forth. But, but I, I came away from that feeling like um, maybe seminary curricula are not giving enough focus on communication. And so the result is then maybe we just focus on the content and the assumption is if we give guys good content and they know good content to proclaim, they'll just know how to do it. And, and the result is you get guys graduating from seminary that can't preach. Okay. Um, and it's as basic as knowing how to communicate. So can you talk to me about those two sides? On the one side, you know, we want to say something like turn away from a desire to be attentive to, uh, you know, how do we say to the world's rhetoric, right? And to the discipline of rhetoric from a world secular standpoint. On the other side, I feel very much like we've got to think about communication and do it well and study the discipline in the sense of knowing how to get an idea across effectively. Any thoughts there? Well, let's start again with the image of God as he gave it to man in creation. We're human. And the, though the fall has marred God's image, we still have so many marks of God's creation on us. And so the essential of being human is communicating. And God said to Adam, when he was still perfect, it is not good for the man to be alone. People are intended to be together and to talk to each other and to live together in community and in harmony and specifically in families. And so we start with the fact that communicating is a human activity that's given to us by God. Uh, to make it very simple, when you preach, be a normal person, be real, relate to the people in your congregation just like they were your family members. And if you have unsaved people who are listening to the gospel, you would speak so warmly and personally to them if you were sitting in a coffee shop or sitting in your house talking to them or standing on the street talking to them. There is true humanity. And we see this expressed by Jesus in the Gospels as he talks so kindly and very personally to individuals like Nicodemus in John 3 and the woman at the well in John 4. And he speaks very directly to the Pharisees, very personally. He knew their hearts from inside out. And so the Lord definitely is a good communicator, even as he walked here on earth, because number one, he was human, and number two, he understood the human heart. And so I would say that the beginning of good communication is understanding the nature of people, because we are that person, and Jesus has delegated that authority to us so that we can relate to each other on a very personal and human level. To the other side of your question, the question is always, how can I be relevant? How do I relate to people? And so we find that Paul said, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. To the Jews, I act like a Jew. To the Greeks, I act like a Greek. And he was speaking here of cultural differences, not the essential sinful nature. And so when we're dealing with sin, that is true throughout all cultures and all times. And when we're dealing with people's need to turn from their sin and to repent and to come to God in the way that God tells us to come, that is universal. And that is true in all cultures and all times. But to the local problems and to the particular needs of one group or another group or one person's background, another person's background, we do what we can to bridge all of those differences mostly by ourselves having direct personal experience. But that does not mean that we ever stray into sin. That does not mean that we take the sinful parts of our culture and act like they can be used in the service of God. We need to keep ourselves pure. Why don't you ask a follow-up question and see where we need to go with this? No, I mean, this is, it's very fascinating because it's, it's, it fits into a broader, we had a discussion, um, this is on the, the advanced level, a discussion of, in biblical theology, kind of the tension between, um, you, you know, in the image of God we're created, but broken, right? And so both of those things are going at the same time. I think those ideas are what you're, you're getting at, right? I mean, there's an element of, in how we're communicating, 
that's based on the image of God that does not change and is absolute. And so on that level, then yes, you communicate skillfully and well and, and study and learn how to do it well. But on the level of the brokenness of humanity, then that's where we're having to um, turn away from something. We're having to actually disconnect from what our culture would tell us to do. Um, what do you think of this idea? Can you interact with this idea? Um, to whatever extent we would use rhetoric or communication theory or um, the discipline of communication to kind of blunt the edge of the message. That's where we're going off. That's where what Paul's correcting for Corinthians one, but to whatever extent we actually use communication, skillful communication to sharpen the message in such a way that it actually con it actually sharpens the conflict with the culture that it actually cuts sharper and really, really hits the culture right where it's off. Um, that's a, a certain type of relevance, if you want to use the word, that is is valid. Um, any interaction you would make with that idea? Yes, I would just summarize everything that we're talking about so far is that God created communication. As humans, we communicate. It's legitimate to study communication, and it's universal. But to the specific problems that a culture may have or these specific ways that a culture may communicate, we have to start with the sinful heart. And this is where the Greeks were completely wrong. They were very perverse. They were very pagan. And so all of their thoughts were focused on creating a beautiful life for themselves here. Or if they did think about the next life, they had demonic understanding of the gods. And so they were very, very confused. Sometimes they said things about human communication that are universally true, and they may have come upon those things by accident. But their goal was always to pursue their idolatry. And this is where our culture today is the same. We may have good scientific understanding of the human mind, or of psychology, or of social relationships in the culture. But the goal of all of that study is never to find God. It is always to elevate humanity. And that's why Paul rejected rhetoric, because rhetoric is designed to make man feel good about himself. And the gospel starts by making man feel really bad about himself because he is out of relationship with God. And so we have to use what the gospel does, which is to show man his sinfulness, and that is never culturally appealing. That is always going to get us in trouble. And Paul, everywhere he went, there was a jail waiting for him because he was always saying things that the culture rejected. In America, we have had freedom, and we have not faced those problems yet. But our brothers around the world have been facing those problems. My father-in-law was a preacher in the Soviet Union and went to Siberia for preaching the gospel and for teaching children and for publishing the Bible. And when you are faced with those kinds of difficulties and challenges, the gospel and the preaching of the Bible becomes very clear and very simple because you deal directly with the truth. That does not mean that you stop being human. It does not mean that you stop relating to other people, but you get very clear focus when you have that kind of opposition. Uh, <clears throat> Good. So let, let's keep going from Good there. Thoughts. Yeah, there were a couple of things here that came up in the chat. Um, Brother Kenetsi just made this comment. Can we draw parallels between current preaching with the Greeks? Um, you know, I would say on the extreme, it occurs to me like a Joel Osteen paralleling that with sophistry and so forth. I mean, this is, you're, you're finding what people exactly what they want to hear and just giving it to them in a, a distilled form. Any thoughts there? Um, interacting with that? We, we have uh, preachers of all different kinds in America, and their number one goal is to have a big crowd and to pay for their big expensive buildings. That means they make a lot of choices that are not what the Bible would have them to do. They might mean well, and I'm sure that they have a desire to do good, but they've chosen mechanisms or methods that get in the way of the truth. 
another question on the chat. When Adam sinned and they were hiding, God was still communicating with them. That is true. God has always been reaching out to sinful people. And his purpose has always been to glorify himself through redeeming his people. The, um, the gospel is very relevant to people in our day. They just don't know it. They are busy pursuing self-improvement. They are busy pursuing false religions, even though they think they are finding God. And the gospel speaks to our real need that we need to repent and turn away from our sin and glorify God. And any kind of preaching that leads people towards a better view of themselves is leading them away from the gospel. We have to get converted. And then if we can live more and more like our Lord Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, that does not give any credit to us. It is a constant battle. Paul said so. I want to do well, but my flesh is fighting against me, and I cannot do the things that I would. And so even as believers, we cannot take credit for any of the good that we do. The gospel is always showing us how God is communicating to us, how we need to repent and change, and we are always 100% dependent on him for any good that happens. And preaching and teaching and the manner of preaching and teaching should point to God, not to point to the preacher and not to point to humans. That's good. I, I had never thought about this passage that you brought up, um, the Genesis 3 passage. I've never thought of this in terms of being paradigmatic for communication. But it, it is interesting when you start processing this a little bit to think, so who is shutting down in that passage? Who's shutting down the communication process? And it's Adam and Eve, right? I mean, they're hiding. God is initiating the communication. And so well, yeah, you've got something there that's um, paramatic, paradigmatic on another level too. God is going to speak. He's going to communicate his message. And he's going to do that in a way that is designed towards restoring the relationship. But it's going to begin with confrontation, right? It's going to begin on it almost uh, an apparently negative note because he's, he's, he's talking to them about what have you done um, with the intention of restoring the relationship. And God is the initiator of the communication. It's very fascinating. I've never thought of that as paradigmatic. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, good, 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 good. Um, I, I see another question in the chat about preaching books and style. Can we talk about books for a while? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we, I, I've spent a lot of time laying a foundation of basic worldview from Christian viewpoint. And that is so that we can answer all of the other topics and discussion points with those uh, agreed upon starting places. Now, the particular or the, the specific applications are going to differ from one person to another. And with these many books from one gifted speaker to another gifted speaker and author. And so it's not my goal to criticize any particular author. Uh, but rather to generally talk about what is good advice and what is advice that may lead us in the wrong direction. Um, the, the, the starting point with preaching is to tell the audience what God said. That's very objective. God has a message to the original hearers and readers of those passages. God spoke to the people of Israel through the prophets. God spoke to the disciples through uh, his actions on earth with them when he was walking around. God spoke to the churches through Paul and John and James and all of the others. There is an original reason that God said something to people. We need to know what that was. And we need to tell people, what did God say? That's the only thing that matters. Now, when we tell people what God said to them, then we understand what he is saying to us. But Bible preaching and teaching is not subjective. It is not, what does it mean to me? And it is not an imaginary use of the Bible as a starting place to go any direction that we want to. And I think as a Bible teachers and preachers and students of the Bible, we understand this. I think what I'm saying is something that we all agree with, that we have to find out what God said. So then the question becomes, how do we share that with other people? And I would begin with the fact that we're all humans, 
and we've all walked in the same sinful pathways, and we know what it feels like to resist God or to respond to God. And so start with God's own work in our own lives, and that is partially understandable by everybody. That's a good starting point. Public speaking and style, I think, is better when it's simple, when it's human and natural and easy for the youngest person, easy for the weakest person to understand. The really intelligent and advanced and professional people always know when they are hearing the real word of God. And their hearts are blessed when they hear God glorified, even at a simple level. But let's say that you have a congregation of <clears throat> very gifted people, and they want more meat and not just the milk. There is the ability to think through the text. There is the need to have good vocabulary, clear sentences, clear structure of the sermon so that a thinking person can think clearly with you and a feeling person can feel the impact of the text on their own hearts as it affected the very first people who ever heard it. And so to me, the style is to follow the style that God gave. The style is to follow the humanity of your hearers. Now, there is great literature in the world. And in the English language, we think of Shakespeare. But I do not speak in poetry from the era of Queen Elizabeth. That, that's not done. And in the cultures that have great literature, there is the high style and there is the plain style. And we appreciate the high style because of its beauty. And sometimes there are very beautiful themes in the Bible that deserve a high style. But that cannot be the total diet for the church all the time. Most of the time, the church needs the plain style, which takes people straight to God and allows them to adore God directly through the text. That's really helpful. Yeah. Um, okay, this idea of the high style, the plain style, helpful, really helpful. And then this idea of you're coming, you're coming to them as a fellow sinner who is also struggling with the same things. And so you're trying yourself, having applied the truth to your own life, then you are, are in a position to have the um, kind of an ethos, to use a rhetorical term, like you have a connection with them because we're in the same boat. <laughs> we're all struggling with the same stuff. We're all messed up in the same way. And yet we're all being, we hope, redeemed by the same truth or you're calling people to be redeemed as you were in the past. Um, so we, oh, we, get, we get this. We're on the same, and we share that commonality in the image of God. Very, very helpful concepts. Good, good. Um, could I shift the conversation towards this communication diagram? Could I, I'll put Great. that up on the screen and yes. can you talk Are you going to put that up? That? Yes, sir. It's coming okay. up. Um, Fabulous. I'll put it up and then I'd like to get your just explanation and talk to us a little bit about what's going on there. Okay. Um, so here we are. Okay, I think you should be seeing that. Do you see that up on your screen now? <coughs> I'm sorry. Did that come yeah, up? The, uh, okay. Great. Okay. okay. So, yeah, any explanation you'd give us or just walk us through what that is and what's going on with it? I want to give credit for the basis of this diagram to my colleague whose office is right on the other side of the wall. Lonnie Polson is a pastor and a communication educator and teacher. And his book, uh, effective speech for the Christian was used for many years here at Bob Jones University. And so this diagram is borrowed from one of the first chapters in the textbook that he wrote. He is not the originator of the diagram. This diagram was created by two researchers in 1947 who worked for the telephone company. And their goal was to explain why people 
had static in the telephone line that made their conversations difficult. And so the uh, model goes back to 1947 and the telephone company and has been in many speech books ever since. So it describes two people talking. And on one side, the presenter is delivering the message. And on the other side, the listener is receiving the message. This model assumes, or at least looks like, one-way communication, which is a lot of times what public speaking is. One person is talking, everybody is listening. But the model also shows that really communication is always two ways. We're always listening and we're always speaking because communication is a relationship. Whether it's one-to-one -one in your kitchen, sitting at the kitchen table, or if you're in a coffee shop, or you're in an office talking to a friend, the communication goes back and forth between both of you. So uh, the box number one is me, the sender, and number two is you, the receiver. And then boxes three and four is the encoding and decoding of the message. How do we get the ideas out of our head and into the air? How do you get the ideas out of the air and into your head? And so this is a description of how the telephone changes voices into electrical signals, how our computer cameras are taking our faces and sharing them around the world so that we can see each other right now. But it has to do with how the mind is working to create speech and to control the body so that you can use your words and your actions to share your ideas. The lines five, six, and seven are the message, the feedback about the message, and then the channels that we are using. So this would be, number line number five would be your message, the sermon. Line number seven would be the church congregation looking at you or falling asleep during the sermon or raising their hand and asking a question in Sunday school or someone typing a text message and asking a question or making a comment and someone just did point, put something on chat. Uh, so these are where communication breakdowns start to happen. The breakdowns become really noticeable with the two dotted circles, the field of experience, where we share something in common, but there's something else that we don't have in common. The most important thing to share in common is language. God created multiple languages at the Tower of Babel, and now we have thousands of languages in the world. And if you don't speak the same language, it is impossible, almost impossible, to communicate. But when you do share the language, then communication can happen, and this is where translators are also valuable. The second area of common understanding is culture. To some extent, there is a universal culture among all people in the world, but we are very aware that cultures are different, and that people have different beliefs and assumptions and values and habits and how they grew up and how they live and what they are taught in their own home countries, and even cultures inside the country are different. And so we want to understand each other's cultures. And then the third area of overlap is common experience. What do we know just from living in this world that we share together? And if the speaker, the preacher, can show that he understands the everyday life of the people that he is talking to, because he is a normal person too, then there's much more common ground because we share common experiences. Of course, the most important common experience is knowing Jesus Christ and valuing the Bible. This is where we work to bridge the difference with unsaved people who have different religious backgrounds or no religion, different cultures, totally opposite cultural values and 
yet God speaks to them through the gospel. And we adapt the gospel, we adapt our speech to them, but we also trust the Holy Spirit to do the work that is universal. Uh, the last part of the diagram is the wavy lines, number nine, that are the way of representing noise or distractions in the environment. And so the first kind of noise is physical noise. That can be sounds that interfere. It can be visual things in the building. Maybe the sunlight is coming through the window on some people in the front row and they can't see because the sun is blinding their eyes. And so phys physical distractions in the environment need to be limited if possible. And so we put in chairs or benches, we point all of those towards the front where the speaker is, or maybe we sit in a circle and everybody is focused on the speaker. That is a way to work with physical distractions. Uh, children and babies are very important participants in the church service, and they need to hear the gospel as young as they can. Sometimes babies cry and scream, and they can't sit still, and uh, so some churches set up special classes for the children so that the gospel can be delivered to them on their level and so that the adults in the main service are not distracted. But everybody needs the gospel. Now, I mentioned to you my wife in their church, they put all the children in the front of the church, all together. And that's a very interesting practice, because sometimes the children sit there and squirm in their seats for the whole sermon. And the people don't mind. It's okay. At least they can see all the kids and they know that they're listening, or maybe listening. Uh, so there are different approaches to dealing with distractions, and every church has their own practice. Uh, you can also have distractions in your own body. You may be sick or tired. You might be hungry. You can be uh, distracted in your mind with problems and anxiety and concern. And maybe the preacher uses an illustration, and that leads to the audience being distracted to the illustration instead of illustrating the point of the message. And so we want to eliminate physical distractions if you can help the audience by eliminating the distractions that their own body have, by making the room comfortable, by making sure that if you need to have a meal for the church so that everybody's not hungry, that's a good thing. If you need to be careful about your illustrations so that you don't lead the audience to think about something else. And then finally, language distractions, uh, technical language that most of the audience doesn't understand. That might make you impressive, but it can also make some of the audience feel that they don't know enough or that this is too complicated and they just quit. Uh, offensive language, language that is unkind or that singles out a specific group in a negative way. Offensive language, of course, is not appropriate in the presentation of the Bible. Uh, it is common in America for preachers to use bad language, cursing, swearing, vulgar speech, because they want to act like their congregation and they want to talk like the person on the street. That is a big mistake because the Bible says, do not let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Um, so we want to eliminate noise wherever possible. There's one last kind of distraction or noise and that is relationship noise. We want to have good relationships with the people in our church because if there is an offense that is not taken care of and the person sitting in the church listening to the preacher feels bad that the preacher hurt them somewhere in the past, this is an area where forgiveness needs to happen. And sometimes the preacher doesn't even know, but for that one person, there is a barrier in the relationship. And so we as leaders have a special responsibility to maintain very good relationships with everybody in our assembly so that we don't ourselves become the noise, the distraction that makes it hard to listen to the Bible. So the model of communication is based on the telephone network 
but it does describe human relationships back and forth. And its best use is to notice places where communication breakdowns can happen. And then you prevent those breakdowns with good planning. If you have a breakdown happening during the church service, you deal with it and you fix it so that it doesn't keep distracting people. And if you only find out about it later, you still go back and you change and you make things better so that the communication is clearer and not disrupted in the future. It's great. Um, a couple of things that are popping in my mind when you're saying some of this. One of the things I loved about the foundation that uh, Dr. Paulson and others laid um, in my own undergraduate education, this idea that you can't not communicate, that everything you're doing is communicating. You're communicating all the time. Somebody put that something to that effect in the chat. I thought that was great. Um, and I think that fits then into the preaching task when you are everything you're doing in the preaching task is part of your total communication package. And so it's, it really is, it's requisite to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, it, it is critical to pay attention and to not just make choices because it seems, um, you know, culturally, it seems cool or it seems like a thing that would be draw people in or so you've got to think about the implications of everything you're doing. Um, what would you think on this, this noise idea, I think is really, really helpful. Uh, the recognition that, and this is to interact a little bit with the videos that we put up. The first video we put up, the guy made this point and he said something like, when the speaker says an idea and they make words, you know, this is an incredible idea, but they make some sounds with their mouths. The idea that is in their heads, the exact, he said, I think he said the exact same idea appears in the heads of the listeners, right? <laughs> Um, and that's, I, I think, incredibly naive, or I, he's probably trying to make a dramatic point and it was just got a little bit ahead of him or something. But uh, could you give us some kind of sense? What's your impression? How, how much when we're speaking, we're trying to communicate an idea, what's your intuition or your feeling of how much of that is staying the same and transcending this and how much is getting lost in noise or getting distorted or the ideas that are actually popping up in people's heads are very different than the ones that we thought came out of our mouths. And, and can we get a way of trying to quantify that a little bit or understand it? Yes. The, the videos that were put up are, are good videos. They have a lot of great ideas, but brother Joel and I both think, that the video that said that you can directly copy an idea from one person's mind to another, this is not communication. This is what is called the silver bullet theory, that you have a beautiful idea, and if you just send it straight, you have communicated. And all you have to do is talk to somebody after your church service or your Sunday school, and you ask them, what did you learn? Or they tell you what they thought about in the sermon, and you know they did not get it. And so it is naive to think that communication is a one-way street. It is not ever that clear. And so we are building understanding, we are building shared meaning so that other people think and come to Bible understanding and not their own understanding. We have, to, we have to check on that. And that's, uh, Isaiah said that there must be line on line and precept on precept, not because that's good teaching, but because the audience is com constantly forgetting. And the audience is constantly going back to their old sinful ways. And we as leaders are constantly tempted to go back to our old sinful ways. And so we must not let the basics go by. But when you do have a group of people who are going forward with the Lord and are really growing and they're not losing what you said last week, they really love the word and they're over one and two and five years becoming more mature. That's where you add new ideas and you go deeper into the scripture and you build a church over a long time that has very mature believers who are able to teach others themselves. That's great. Uh, um, have you ever, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Have you ever had the, have you ever had the experience of you have a thought and you work with it and you try to communicate this thought and somebody comes after to you afterwards and says, really appreciate that. Help me. And, 
and they tell you why it helped you. And what they tell you is the exact opposite of what you said, where, you know, you wanted to correct an idea and they came back to you and said, I really, this helped me because I saw for the first time that, and they said the idea you were trying to correct, um, yeah. which tells you that something went wrong possibly on your end. It could have gone wrong on their end too. Maybe some extent that idea is so embedded, they don't want to give it up. I don't know, but um, any, any feelings there, any, any anecdotally or your expressions there, how, how you're working with that kind of thing. I would be interested if we could have a chat about that. If people are willing to type some of their own experiences, have you met people in your church or Sunday school or Bible class? And it's obvious that they did not understand they actually came up with something that is wrong, even though you know you told them the truth. And, and I would be curious, can we talk about that as a class? What kind of things have you seen happen in your own life and experience? Yes, please, anybody chat, or even if you wanna hit your microphone, um, give us some feedback there, are things that are going on for you just right in the trenches, uh, this kind of thing that has come up, or an anecdote, personal experience. Uh, any struggles with that? Any kind of comments, feel free. Um, okay, good. Um, and while that's coming in, maybe I'll throw out one more question and then we can come back and, and I wanna interact with what's coming. So please feel free from anybody, your comments about what Dr. Kilmeyer just said. Can you help us with this whole, in your diagram, there's, or Dr. Polson's diagram, there's a feedback loop, right? I mean, in other words, we are communicating to people, but then they're also communicating back to us. Very fascinating, isn't it? You basically just asked for, by doing that, you just asked for the feedback loop, right? We're asking for the person on the other end of the communication to, to speak back to us. Um, how do we increase that feedback loop in a way that we are better able to monitor what's really going on in our congregations or the people we're speaking to and to know whether they get it or whether it's clear or whether we are failing? in how we're communicating it and not making it clear enough. Any, any practical help there? Uh, let, let's, let's take this idea and mix it together with some of the chat comments that are coming in. Um, it, it's obvious that preaching is first of all proclaiming. And maybe you have already discussed the word keruso and the other Greek words that are the definitions that Paul and the other apostles used to describe the action of preaching. Uh, so first of all, we are declaring what God said, and that is a one-way message. However, that's mostly when you're standing in front of the congregation, but the preacher and the teacher's life is lived in his town and community with the people, and so there will be many opportunities for personal conversations, and that's where you find out what people are really thinking. And um, uh, we have to be faithful to the truth, and the truth will offend people, but we ourselves do not need to be offensive. Uh, Paul told the servant of God, do not strive, don't be a fighter, don't get in people's faces and attack them personally, because that is not the nature of the gospel. It is the nature of the gospel to win people with the beauty of Jesus Christ as they see how terrible their sin is, and the Holy Spirit draws them. So it's not human effort that does the work, although God does use humans to talk for him. Um, the, so that, that's, you know, the, the language, the, the Bible will offend people, but we ourselves don't want to be offensive as preachers and teachers. Um, <clears throat> okay. John Glass says, my experience is that if one or two people get it, I'm happy. That's great. <laughs> the, uh, the small remnant who is really listening, I hope over many years that more and more people in the congregation are willing to grow and to leave the world behind and to really love and adore the Bible. I have to stop for a minute and talk. Uh, the, our, the, the three of us men have known one really influential pastor for our whole adult lives. Is Mark Minnick going to be part of this series, or is he in other teaching? He's the next lecture. Yeah, okay. uh, lecture I, coming up on Friday. I, when, when you all meet Pastor Minnick, Dr. Mark Minnick, on Friday, he has shepherded all of us 
for more than 20 years, whether through his pulpit or through his classes here at the university or through private conversations and small group study in his office. And so I, I think all of us come from that same general viewpoint and I wanna give a word of appreciation to Dr. Minnick, your teacher on Friday. He is like a Spurgeon, a prince of preachers. He loves the word, he loves his people. And over the decades, he has built a congregation of people who are deeply grounded in the word. I'm not praising the people. I'm not praising the church and I'm not praising the pastor. I'm saying that this is the model that Paul said in the New Testament to grow people over a long time and they become mature in their understanding of the Bible and in their walk with the Lord and they raise children who sometimes turn out really well and every parent wishes for that and hopes for that and prays for that. It's always the work of the Holy Spirit but there are humans who help us and you're going to meet a great helper on Friday. Mark Minnick is uh, God's servant, and we love him. Uh, so that I have to give credit because that's where so many of my ideas have come just from watching him over the years and, and listening to him. Uh, are, are we getting close to the time for a pause? Yes. Um, I'll throw a thought in here, and then uh, maybe we'll think about something over the break. Um, something that stuck out to me from what you just said a moment ago and I I appreciated very much um, the idea that in order to get feedback or understand to complete this loop and know where people are at well I mean preaching is by definition one way it is and it kind of has to be or it kind of ought to be um, so I don't know that you can turn it into a classroom and I don't think you should um, I don't think it's helpful something it started to become a thing where you know they'll set up a Twitter feed and they'll have the screen up on the side and then people can tweet in their questions and the questions are popping up on a screen in the front of the auditorium while the guy's preaching and stuff like that. And that, this is something that I would be philosophically opposed to. I mean, because it's, it, it has to be proclamation and it is a very one-way mode of communication. But what you express there, I think it really nails it that, that if you don't know where they're at or what they're thinking, you also aren't able to proclaim in an effective way. And so the way to, to bridge that gap probably is to have a lot of conversations outside of the preaching moment, right? That you're, you're working at going back to people and, and, and finding out what they were thinking. I do know some guys that are doing now, um, let's say they'll do the Sunday morning service and then they'll have a Sunday school hour afterwards and it's a question and answer time and people can bring questions and discuss further about the sermon. Um, you'd have to decide if that makes sense in your particular cultural context. But a lot of American guys are doing that and seeing some good successes with that and, and find that they get some good interaction happening. Don't know. You just have to figure out if that's your context or not. Um, but, you know, minimum, I think it's a good, you've got to have conversations to know what people are thinking. Okay. Um, here's a question I want us to think about over the break, the next five minutes. Or Dr. Kimmeyer, did you want to say anything follow up for what I just said? I would just say that as the pastor or the teacher, you need to understand the people that you are with. And uh, uh, at the beginning, in the introduction, uh, you heard that I had spent some time, about a year, in Switzerland at a Christian ministry. And, and I really had to change my thinking about the audience, because I was used to college teaching and a very deep church assembly every week but the place that I was in Switzerland, uh, wonderful believers, but most of them were in their 70s and 80s. And I just had to change for the audience's sake. Also because my German was very rough and I, I myself had to be simple, but I had to stop thinking that I was talking to college students and graduate students. That was a big mistake. I, I, it was not a seminary, it was everyday people. And so it changed my style and it helped me to be much more, um, can I say human? Because maybe graduate students are not human. Well, at least <laughs> you, you've got to be with the people and, and understand their lives and their work and their families and their trouble. 
And when you're on that personal level, you're going to do a lot better. That's great. Good. Um, lots of different questions I want to go or directions I want to go off of that, but if we can't, so let's do it. Let's take a five minute break. Um, during this five minute break, what I'd like to think about is Pastor Elric's question here, which I think is really helpful. He's coming from a Filipino context. Preaching about Mary yes. to a new believer or an unbeliever is going to be offensive to them in the sense of you're, you're correcting, don't pray to Mary and so forth. Okay. So, um, and then same thing with idols, which, uh, you know, icons and like, you know, even putting food in front of an icon and so forth. With, these are things that are very, very real things in a Filipino context. Okay. So, how then do you confront that? And what I'm getting at with that, of course, not specifically that one context, what I'm getting at there is I want to think about how do you speak to an adversarial audience or an audience that has deep reservations about what you're going to say to them? And how do you work through that? Because it is going to be very deeply offensive. How do you get through? And how would you approach that? Can we think about that over the break, the next five minutes? I've got three minutes after the hour. So let's be back at eight minutes after the hour. And then I want to get Dr. Kielmeyer's feedback on an adversarial audience and how we would work that. We'll see you in five minutes at eight minutes after the hour. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Um, great. Okay. So any comments you want to make about the adversarial position if, or the, the, the adversarial situation or any comments that anyone else wants to add about that question and that discussion, particularly this issue? Okay. I'm going to start off by looking at the example of Paul in the New Testament. There were many places where people were willing to give him a hearing, and they were able to be converted. There were other places where, in the middle of his sermon, he was stopped and they tried to stone him. And so these are the extreme possible responses to the gospel. And, and the Bible knows or tells us that this is the nature of the human heart. We don't need to be afraid of the audience because the Bible already told us how the audience thinks. And even Paul, when he went to Athens, this is the center of Greek philosophy, and he preached personally all over the city until finally they said, come to Mars Hill, the Areopagus, come to the judgment seat, and let's hear you. And at the end of his very long sermon about the creation and the resurrection, some people mocked and other people said, let's talk about this later. And other people believed. And there were a few really prominent people who believed, but there just wasn't much happening in Athens. So Paul went on to other places. Uh, this is not a failure by Paul. He was not manipulating the gospel to fit Greek culture. He did know Greek culture, but he correctly communicated the identity of God as the creator and of Jesus Christ, the mediator who was risen from the dead. And that brought the audience to the crisis of decision. And so you just have to expect different responses. But to the specific question about working with people who love Mary, I'll tell a story first of my own encounters, and I'll make a few suggestions, and then I would love to hear what other people have discovered. Uh, I was traveling as a young man, maybe 23 years old, 24 years old, in Poland. Poland is the most Catholic country in the world, except maybe the Philippines, and you would think Italy is Catholic, but it's not practicing nearly as much. And so I felt like I needed to deliver the gospel and contrast it with Catholicism. I mentioned candles, and I mentioned prayers to saints and other things, and I don't know what the interpreter translated, but after the sermon was done, the missionary came to me and said, Greg, please preach Jesus Christ. They will know the difference, and here we don't use candles, and so that may be in other places, but here it, it's not what we do. Um, now, that was an American missionary who was a guest in that country, and he was trying to deal with the audience as a visitor to the country. And so his practice was to emphasize Jesus Christ instead of criticizing Mary. Now, what I will say is that would be appropriate for a guest in a country who doesn't know the whole circumstance. And so as a guest speaker in other countries, I stopped talking about other religions and I only talked about Jesus. And people will notice, they know your affiliation, they know what church you're with, 
And, and so they know that there's a difference. And when people come up to you afterwards and say, oh, well, I believe that also, uh, maybe they have different definitions. Maybe they have different assumptions about the meaning of the verses. And so that's where you have to be very careful to define your terms because your understanding of the Bible is different from theirs and the definitions really matter or you will have total misunderstanding. Um, my parents, as I mentioned to you, got saved when they were 35. Both of them were raised in culturally Christian situations. Both of them went to church as children. Both of them did the rituals that the churches offered to them. But they did not know Jesus personally because they never really heard the gospel. And they didn't know that they were sinners and they didn't know that Jesus would save them. They didn't know that they had to repent. They were trusting in baptism and confirmation and other Christian church rituals. And, and I think people who love Mary are afraid of Jesus because they think they need a helper. And if we show them how beautiful Jesus is and show them that we have direct access to God through Jesus, we don't need other mediators. When they start to find that out, they're, they're going to have one of two reactions. They're going to fall in love with Jesus or they're going to hate you because you're messing with their religion. Um, I, I think that people who, I, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm, th I'm wondering, I think that people who want other ways to come to God have never really seen the true beauty of Jesus. And so I think that the missionary in Poland that was telling me, preach Jesus, was giving me really good advice, especially as a visitor. Now, if you live and work with Catholic people every day, maybe you have a different viewpoint, and I would be interested to know what has worked and helped you. That's good, though. The, the understanding and to recognize what's really going on with uh, Mariolatry is that it's basically like, I need a halfway point. I mean, actually, and in 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 the mind is that like, Jesus is so exalted, I can't, I can't go directly to him. Well, no, the answer to that is Jesus is your intercessor. Jesus is your intercessor between God and man. Um, that's great. Um, I wish we could talk more about this, but I have two concepts that I really desperately want to make sure we get through. And one of them is audience analysis. And then the other one is honing down or focusing your message so that you really identify and communicate a central core idea that you, you have a core idea that you are communicating. But um, can we start with the audience analysis question? Um, what, what kinds of questions are you asking yourself uh, when you have an audience, what kind of things are you noticing when you walk into the room? Um, I should have said this first. A great anecdote here <laughs> is when I started talking to Dr. Kilmeyer about doing this talk, okay, um, and doing this lecture. We met, and he peppered me with a whole bunch of questions about the situation, okay? And I was very, it was very fascinating because I've We've had a number of different teachers. I don't know that anybody else has done that like that before. And I thought, this is why we have a communications guy, and I want to hear from him because he is asking exactly the right questions, right? He's doing audience analysis. He wants to know what is the situation like and how does it work? And that's the essence of, or a starting point, I should say, on knowing how to do good communication. So any, any thoughts there? What questions are you asking yourself about your audience? What do you notice when you walk in the room or when you begin doing something to, uh, to have a communication event when something's going to happen? I always want to know as much about the people as possible so that I can find any common ground that we already have or so that I can be aware of differences that could interfere with the relationship. And so that's why I wanted to know as much as I could about you. And as I see your pictures on the screen, I really wish that I could meet you in person and talk and hear your story about God has, how God has led you and to know about the ministry that he's given you and the life that you are living. And I think that's one of the reasons that we will fellowship for a long time in heaven because we will have so many things to say to each other about what God did. If we bother at all to remember the earth, uh, we'll, we'll give glory to the Lord about those experiences. <clears throat> um, I, I want to know who these people are. I want to know what they think. I want to know how they feel. I want to know about their work and their employment or their lack of employment 
or how they work for themselves, or do they work in a factory or in a field, or do they work in an office or in a government bureau or a doctor's office? I want to understand the experiences that have shaped their lives. I want to know about their children, their grandchildren, their grandparents. I want to understand if the culture is very individual like the United States, or if the culture is very collective, like many cultures in Asia have a very strong sense of community. Uh, I want to understand if they're from a big city and if they're accustomed to all of the modern things that happen in big cities. Um, I'm not from a big city. Greenville is about 500,000 people. And uh, that's a small town. My wife came from Moscow, Russia, 12 million people. And um, she didn't even need a car. She had no driver's license. She could go anywhere, three hours distance, any direction, all by herself, all over Moscow. And when she married me and came to the United States, she, she couldn't go anywhere. She was stuck in a small town. And it was hard. <laughs> I did not know that. I thought, she's happy. She's with me in America. No, she was bored <laughs> because she was cut off from big city life. And I'm the country mouse and she's the, the big city person. <laughs> and uh, when, if we visit New York City or if she came to Shanghai or Tokyo or Singapore or any of the other world's great cities, she would love it because the big city experience is really different from a small town or from the country. I was born in Wisconsin and I looked out my bedroom window to a cornfield. And uh, we were not farmers, but we were surrounded by farmers. And um, so I, I just wanna know the people because people are interesting and, and people have stories. And uh, some people lived really moral lives and very religious lives. Other people sinned in all different ways they could try. And some people are very refined and other people are very rough. And some people love school and study and other people hate school. My brother hated school. He's so good with his hands. And some people are good with sports. That was my other brother. He played American football and he's big and muscular and I can't. You know, everybody's different. And um, everybody has the same universal need. They need the gospel. But everybody has a different way of hearing what they are hearing. And so we, as we are people, we relate to each other. We've got to understand and ask a lot of questions. Now, that's about the humans. What about the, the setting? What if it's a big church with lots of chairs? What if it's a small classroom with just a few chairs and a few people? Um, what if, uh, because in a big room, you need a different style than you need in a small room. You need microphone maybe, or you need to be able to lift up your voice if there is no microphone. Uh, preaching on the street is really different from preaching in a nice church building. And I've done some preaching. I preached on Red Square in Moscow, and the soldiers came up and they did not arrest me. They asked me questions about John 3.16. That was in 1993, right after the wall came down. Good memories. Uh, it, it's, everything is different. So you got to understand the experiences of your people and how their assumptions are different, how their lives are different, how the setting is different. Uh, it's if, let, let's say that your church has a morning service and then a lunch and then an afternoon service. What's the biggest problem in the afternoon service? Everybody is sleepy because the food made them sleepy. So you, you have to think about basic facts. And maybe you have a seven in the morning prayer service, or maybe you have an all night prayer service on a special holiday. And, and the children are going to get really tired by 10 or 11 at night, and they're going to cry or they're going to fall asleep or, you know, just the circumstances make a difference. Um, the circumstances in your country, there are historic things that come up every year. There are crisis events that happen in your country that make people uh, very aware that they are in need. And, and so the circumstances change. And 
Um, and you have to understand yourself. So you analyze the audience, the situation, and yourself, the speaker. Why, why are you here? What is your goal? Are, are you confident today? Are you nervous today? Are you really well prepared? Did you have no time to prepare? Are you walking very closely with the Lord and you know his spirit is on you? Or are you having a bad week and your spirit is struggling? Uh, I don't think we should put on masks. I don't think we should pretend. But also we need to lead the people of God in worship and exhibit the right attitudes, even if we don't feel the right attitudes at that moment. So you've got to understand yourself, the, the speaker, and your relationship with the people. Can you help me triangulate between three ideas here? Um, so, yeah, that's very fascinating when you said that because I, I find myself triangulating between those exact three things, okay? You've got to be deeply conscious of your audience where you, you're feeling what's going on. You're aware, like, okay, wait, whoa, I'm losing people or people are getting distracted or, you know, just this last Sunday... Um, I'm speaking and an, a child started crying over here. And so I'm looking at the eyeballs and all the eyeballs are going that way. You, you, you have to notice that stuff and you have to respond accordingly. Um, being self-conscious, how am I coming across? And yet at the core, I want to be consumed with my message. I want my message to be central. And somehow the message has a priority that's even deeper. In other words, if um, if, if, if all I'm doing is responding to people, I'm kind of mirror reading, or if all I'm thinking about is how do I look, then I'm being, I'm just being vain. And so putting those three together, any, any thoughts about how you're kind of doing, managing, keeping all three of these balls up in the air, um, but keeping the message central and making that the priority, that that's the core of what you're doing and not just mirror reading them and not just thinking about yourself. I want to, um, borrow a little bit from my experience acting in plays. I mentioned Shakespeare. I've done a little bit of Shakespeare acting. We clean it up. We don't do the yucky stuff. I hope I haven't offended you by mentioning theater. Um, we, we do it in a Christian way. I, I learned from uh, Bob Jones Jr., who was a wonderful, elegant preacher of the gospel and also a very good actor that you cannot splatter. Okay, the word splatter, you know, you throw some liquid at the wall and it goes everywhere, splatter. As an actor, it is possible to be so involved in your character that you lose control. And instead of pretending to cry like an actor, you're actually crying. And instead of acting like you are tired, you stay the whole night and you never sleep, and you're actually exhausted. This is not good. Now, the splatter is bad. If you are so caught up in the emotion of the moment, you may lose control of your mind and your body and do things that should not happen. You could scream or cry, or you could make some silly remark that could offend somebody in the audience. So you're always aware of yourself but you always have to be aware of the message. You've got to know what you are communicating and you have to be devoted to that message and you've got to be aware of yourself and the audience. Let me use a different illustration. If you are a good sports player, basketball, uh, European football, soccer, or any other sport, you practice that sport over and over and you make certain moves in the gymnasium, in the sport, in the field house, and you practice those moves. But during the game, it's never that way. You have plans, but in the game, it just happens on the spot. You're an expert. You do the right thing immediately. The same thing with a musician. The musician practices the keyboard or the instrument over and over and over so that the right thing happens the right way in the moment when it matters the most. Okay, so a preacher is similar because talking is a physical as well as mental and spiritual skill. You want to be a good talker. You don't want to be tripping over your words. 
and saying, um, and forgetting your ideas, then, then you can't communicate. Those are barriers. So just practice. Learn how to present smoothly. Um, learn how to think about your audience while you are also thinking about your message. So what I'm talking about here is being an expert. Some people say if you do something for 5,000 hours, you are now an expert. Okay, that's, that's uh, several years of professional activity. And so at the beginning, none of us is ever an expert, but over time, you would develop two tracks in your brain. You, you stay on the message. You are interacting with the Holy Spirit. Have you done that in a sermon? Do you know when the Holy Spirit is helping you? Do you know when he is carrying you along? And at the same time, you are aware of the people in the room and you are aware of the microphone just turned off or the child is crying or someone got up and walked out and you're not distracted by those things, but you maintain an awareness of them if they affect the sermon. And I, I am not a intellectual genius with a high IQ. I go back to Charles Spurgeon. It was said that Charles Spurgeon could maintain four or five distinct ideas in his brain at the same time. And maybe I can hold two or maybe one, <laughs> but you use all of your mental power to do the professional expert thing. Deliver your message with the full energy that the message deserves and you manage the situation with the other track in your mind. And so that will prevent you from being boring and that will also prevent you from being totally distracted by the congregation. And that's that the Holy Spirit can actually help you to do those things at the same time. Great, really good. Um, how much of this, let's say you're in a completely new situation, like, you know, you're asked to go somewhere you've never been before or something, you come in, how much of your, your adjusting to that situation would you say at this point in your life is, is kind of subconscious? You just do it. Um, you've gotten into the habit of doing it and you're just, you, you come in and you're just doing it. Or how much of it has to be on the level of consciousness that you are, you are actually intentionally thinking about, okay, this is the kind of, okay, I, therefore I need to adjust what I'm going to say in the following ways to fit into this place and to reach them in a, in a clear way. I think a true expert is always aware of the situation, whether they're a music performer, a sports performer, a politician, I think a preacher. We're talking about a communication skill. And I think it's very important to remind yourself that the people may have changed. Even if it's your church and they're the people you know well, and you saw them all week long, or you saw them last Sunday, it's never the same place twice. Just the same as it is with our own families and spouses and children, if we get into an automatic habit, the longer that habit goes automatic, the less connected we are to the real people. Now, because today we're in a new situation, I'm new to you, and you are new people for me, I was very aware that this is a special occasion. And, and I'm really enjoying being with you. Thank you so much for this privilege. I think it's better if we look at everything as a special occasion. Now that's hard to do because it takes a lot of energy and we don't always have the time. And, and sometimes we're in a big hurry and maybe someone stopped us before the church service and had a complex conversation and it was the worst moment for that topic and um, you know maybe you had to go and fix a light bulb or do something that was not spiritual you had to fix something you know with the plumbing um, these things happen but the Lord will give you grace to come back and to remember the situation remember the word and, and sometimes he does things beautifully when we feel terrible and we think we failed that's okay because god can do good things even when we didn't have what we thought we should that's helpful. Don't plan for that 
don't intentionally fail to prepare. <laughs> but uh, trust the Lord. Do you have this experience sometimes um, when I, what do you say? When I go into a situation and I, I knew ahead and I should have prepared and I didn't, then I feel very much like I'm on my own today. <laughs> and, and when I go into a situation where somebody kind of, they, they drop something on me last minute and there was absolutely nothing I could do. Um, you know, right before, okay, actually we want you to do this topic instead. Okay. Um, you know, you just, then I have very much the sense of, okay, well, I'm going into this, Lord, you're, this is, this one is yours, right? I mean, I really, my conscience is clean. I did everything I humanly could do. Um, but I feel very responsible when I don't have that choice and, or when I had the time and I didn't make the choice to actually prepare. And that's when I feel like I'm on my own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had a surprise? I'm seeing oh, yeah. faces. Does everybody know that feeling of surprise? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about homiletics and the, the philosophy of how much preparation you should do. Um, because we are all confronted sometimes with surprises and there's no chance to prepare. In those circumstances, the advice of my public speaking mentor uh, when I was in college, she said, always have five times more material than you have time to cover. In other words, you are always reading, you are always looking for new ideas, you are always going deeper than you have time to share. And, and this is true across your whole life because you are a student of the word and you, you ask the Lord to prepare you and you get active in preparing. Okay, so that's, that's the whole path. In other words, you should not be surprised by most Bible topics. There, there may be some very rare Bible topics that you have not studied, and that would be a good time to admit that you don't know. <laughs> Instead of pretending and making something up and being found out to be wrong. That would be awful. <laughs> but uh, to the theory or the belief that people should prepare Bible sermons, I think that is the assumption of this set of meetings together that we want to prepare better. Now, my father-in-law, who is a pastor preacher in Russia, their congregation does not believe that you need to prepare lengthy outlines and deep study. And so most of the men in the church stand up and open the Bible to the thing that they read most recently and they comment for anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes, and they will have two or three brothers in the church make those kinds of remarks. And, and they are serving God, and they love God, and they are teaching the truth. However, that's not my philosophy. I, I am more towards the side of preparing well in advance. The Holy Spirit can lead you in your study, with your computer, with your Bible, with your books, and you can prepare a gourmet meal instead of pulling things out of the bag and serving them unprepared. God can use both, but over the lifetime of a church, the shallow, spontaneous approach will leave the congregation shallow. And over the years, very careful preparation will help the most of the people in the church to grow deeply. That's good. That's helpful. Um, maybe that segues us into this next discussion, which is to think about uh, having a central message. So, um, yeah, okay. H how do you integrate the fact that when you are, if you're speaking for 45 minutes, you're clearly saying a lot of different things, right? I mean, you're clearly not just going to say the same thing for 45 minutes with different words. And so how do we interact the diversity or the plurality of concepts in general with the idea of unity at the core? Or how would you just, how would you, how would you think through this of the unity of con conceptual unity in, in what you're going to say overall? I really like this question because it goes to the center of what we think a sermon is. A sermon is supposed to be the words of God displayed and explained and interpreted to the people. And so we find this in Ezra 
when the people of God gather together for the first time in a long time to hear the Bible read aloud in public. And they built a special platform, and then the priests, first of all, read the Word of God. So just the plain hearing of the Word of God is important. Second, <clears throat> they gave the sense. In other words, they explained unfamiliar, archaic Hebrew words to the people who were used to speaking Aramaic, and they maybe lost some of the original translation, and so they had to explain the sense of the words, and then they had to give the meaning. In other words, they had to tell the people, this is how the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures, change your actions. And so there is, th this is what we talk about in homiletics class, state, illustrate, and apply, or state, explain, and make the application. Now, uh, this is maybe a Western viewpoint, possibly European and American. Um, I would be interested to know if other cultures have different viewpoints about this kind of clarity. But in general, I think we are still close enough to the Bible that it's not a cross-cultural problem. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves, what did God say in this text? What did God say about this topic? And uh, Mark Minnick, who you will hear on Friday, he talks about going across the scripture like a plow and deep down into the scripture like drilling a well. So sometimes you have to understand the topic all the way through the Bible, and other times you drill down deep into a passage in Romans or one of the epistles where the content is very complicated. We have to understand different types of Bible literature. There is story and narrative, and this is mostly the Gospels. There is conversation. This is Jesus talking to people. There is history in the Old Testament books, the book of Acts. There is the theoretic and applicational teaching of the epistles. And so, um, and, and then there's the legal content of the Pentateuch. And so we have to understand the whole of Scripture, the depth of the individual text, and the interrelationships. Second, we want to understand the type of literature that we're dealing with. And then the third question, are we trying to cover the whole topic as a survey? Are we trying to show at a middle level how different passages fit together? Or are we focused only on one idea from one passage? And all of these are choices that you have to make, and all of them will change your structure in your outline. I'm assuming that outlining is a way to prepare. Someone asked, shall I write a script and read it? My only answer is, if the script is clearly organized, that can be good. If the script is random and goes all over, then you, you might have a very fuzzy script. Um, so to the main question, <clears throat> each sermon needs to have a central idea one big message from God that is in the text. And it's got to be justifiably from the text. We can say many true things about the Bible, but if they don't come from that text, then you are not helping your people to grow. You are only manipulating their behavior. You've got to have the truth from the text. And then that's the centerpiece of your sermon, and you organize everything towards the text. Um, am I starting to go in the direction that you were interested? Yeah, you know, I mean, here's what happens. I, I um, so I end up teaching preaching classes in the Philippines, BJMDC. Um, so you've, it's young guys, they're just coming in. Some of them are doing their first sermon and so forth. Or it may be guys that have done quite a few sermons. Um, you know, so I'm, I'll sit down and I'll listen to six sermons in a row, just straight through. Um, and it's good. It's encouraging to see guys working at it. I understand they're getting started and so forth. One of the concerns I have, though, sometimes is you end up, so they're working really hard to try to walk you through a passage. So they basically what happens is, you know, verse like two mentions love or something. So they, they preach, they do a little talk about love. Verse three includes the word grace. So they talk about grace. Verse four, you know, 
so, so forth. And so it's, it ends up being kind of like three little sermons where you have three or four different concepts that are mentioned and you kind of camp out on each one and then you say next point, you go to the next point. And, and I feel like maybe what's at the core, there's definitely not one big idea that's got communicated, but to take that and link that into our broader philosophy I'm preaching, I feel like they've not yet found the underlying logic of the passage, that the passage itself has a flow of thought. It's taking you from A to B. And so that's one of my burdens is to try to help guys see my students do that is understand the passage deeply so that when you communicate, you're talking people from here, 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 there. And you had your, that is, you have a single train of thought, a logic, an underlying flow of thought or a single concept that this passage is, is hitting so heavily. Um, that's kind of the thoughts I have there. Can you help me there or help fill that out? Yes. And I would say that, um, all of us who are, are having these sessions together with you share the same vision for learning to understand the whole counsel of God as it relates to each other from every book and every topic from the beginning to the end. <clears throat> and our goal is, as our pastor has taught us, to grow the saints into maturity. And that kind of maturity requires a lot of thinking. And it takes a long time to build a church that is willing to listen that way. And so you can't do this in one month. It, it takes years to grow your people. And that's why as a guest speaker, I usually take a simpler approach, maybe a topical or just a, you know, just one passage. But, but to the illustration, if you just go word by word and verse by verse and you make remarks on the topic, that's okay. You will say true things and people will be glad to hear about love and grace and they'll go home and they will have food from God. That's okay. And if you're teaching children, you probably need to do that. My son is six and I have a son who is three and they need really simple, straight teaching that is very easy for them to understand. You've got to know your people in your church. And if they need simple things, then please give them simple things. Don't try to be a seminary teacher when your congregation is on the level of the sixth grade. But when, you're, when the core of your people can be helped to grow, that's when this much more careful analysis should be attempted. And so what we're talking about here is understanding a whole passage. We can say a paragraph, especially in Paul, or understanding a whole story in the history books or in the Gospels. <clears throat> And then we take that paragraph and we see it in the whole chapter and we see the chapter in the whole book. For instance, many of the epistles are half doctrine and half application. And so you have to know, is my passage in the doctrine part or is it in the application part? What is the message of the entire book? For instance, Galatians is dealing with false teaching and drawing people back to Jesus Christ. And so that book theme becomes the controlling influence for every paragraph because every paragraph is helping to develop that book theme and every verse is developing every paragraph and where does Galatians fit in the entire New Testament and when did Paul write that and why and where in the first century is this part of the youth the young years of the church in Acts or is this part of the more mature message to the churches that have been growing? Or is this the really mature message to the church of Ephesus straight from Jesus Christ's mouth through John in Revelation? Ephesus gets so much time in the New Testament from its very founding to Paul's years of being with them to the book that he wrote to them to the other letters that got shared with them. And then finally, Jesus talks to Ephesus and says, you guys have all of the religious knowledge, but you don't remember me. And this is the second and third generation of what happens to really well-taught people. 
And so those are mature people and they should have known better. In other words, the goal of your sermon needs to be loyal to the text and it needs to be suitable for the level of your audience. And over many years, you can bring these people to a very high level of Bible understanding. If you, know, you have a long time with them. And I mean, we do believe in, even philosophically, or as part of our theology, we believe that uh, the nature of scripture is such, it, can, it will challenge the most studied minds, but it's understandable to a child, right? And so it's given that, that reality, it is possible then to take the same passage and be able to communicate it on all of those different levels as a function of preaching being a function of the nature of scripture itself. Um, and so you, you, it can be done. It takes, it takes a lot of thought or planning. It takes some skill, but it's possible to communicate high concepts in a way that someone at a very low educational level goes, wow, that was so clear. I get it. I got it. Yes. Um, it is possible to do this. And we have to, I think we have to be confident and ready to do that, ready to step out, <laughs> ready to believe that right. this is possible. Uh, I'll tell another story about meeting the audience where they are and meeting the situation. Um, <clears throat> when I was in Switzerland with the Christian ministry, my Greenville pastor, Mark Minnick came and in 40 minutes with translation, he took the entire book of John and preached the entire book in 25 minutes. He had just finished a four year series, paragraph by paragraph through the book. And I remembered the entire series from listening to it. And when he preached in that 45 minute window, I knew everything that he was doing, except that I thought he should preach the academic detail. And instead, he took all of that years of knowledge and brought it to a very conversational, very personal talk. He didn't lack the knowledge. Instead, he came to the people right where they were and in 25 minutes gave them a beautiful gift. The, the, beauty of the book of John and the beauty of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And, and th this is what I mean. Not that you make the text too simple and that you ignore the truth by making it shallow, but rather that you know everything that could be said and you select the right part that needs to be said for this group today. That's Whether great. you're one time or you're there for years. That's great. I've got, um, I've, we've got 10 minutes and I've been collecting questions from the chat. And so we've got maybe four or five, maybe six questions. So we get like 150 seconds per question. Let's go. Um, let me see if I can go. So someone is asking here, uh, basically, when we say dynamic preaching, when we talk about dynamic preaching, <clears throat> Sometimes I think what we mean, or he's suggesting, sometimes what we mean by that is um, the voice is loud and the look is kind of like you're angry. And the, the concepts or the content of the preaching itself may not be that dynamic or may not, <laughs> there may not even be anything. And we can walk away with that and say, wow, that was so dynamic. Um, so how to counteract for that or how to train people to think differently or how to make sure we don't fall into that trap ourselves. We need balance, we need zeal for the truth, we need love for the people, and you need to look awake on Sunday morning. If you look sleepy, the congregation will feel sleepy. Now, if you look crazy, then we should wonder about you. But Paul did say we are fools for Christ. However, let's not just be fools, all right? So there, there is an American uh, saying, weak point, shout louder. And, and, and shouting is not the thing. We are, we are the heralds of the truth of God, but we need to understand the style of our people. And in early American history, shouting was common. Right now, we're much more sophisticated, and sometimes we're just plain boring. Uh, so love your text, love the word, love your people, and that's going to keep you alive and moving forward. It's great.
Um, you've already touched on this one, uh, but I want to get your input again. So the pros and cons of doing transcript versus doing it extemporaneously. What are the advantages, disadvantages? What do you, what do you recommend? I do both, depending on the situation. My personal favorite is extemporaneous, where I speak from notes. That has a weakness that you can go on rabbit trails. A prepared text has the strength of saying exactly what you mean to say. But the weakness with, extempor with manuscript is that your voice gets very small and you get monotone and boring in your delivery style. So <clears throat> do both well and avoid the weaknesses of both. Right. Very good. Uh, even, I guess, having the ability to do both is going to allow you to meet different situations, isn't it? Um, okay, someone asked here, and uh, this makes sense to me, uh, having had this, because it's coming from a, specifically the context, my own context in the Philippines, um, have this experience where you're preaching and you look out and there's somebody just talking. <laughs> um, and so, you know, people are very respectful in my context, but occasionally you can have a visitor or that can be a, just a person who's just sitting there, um, you know, maybe whatever, whatever they're situated, I don't know. But they're just having a conversation while you're preaching. And so this, uh, this person who messaged me is asking, how do you deal with that? Because you're continuing to preach, they're continuing to talk. Um, what do you do? Well, if they're talking for several minutes, that means you have lost their attention. And they're probably not remarking about your sermon. That means somebody is bored. And somebody lost the point. So maybe, uh, I was teaching a class last night, and there were two people sitting in the front, and they were having their own conversation. And they were chattering, and I think the rest of the people behind started to get a little bit irritated. But it died down, and they quit. And I actually engaged them because we have a more classroom environment, maybe not a sermon to do that, but uh, I, would, I would start with ignoring it and letting it die out. But if it doesn't die out, then there's something wrong probably with your sermon because you have lost the audience and one person is telling you that. Otherwise, they're, they're, they just may, maybe need to be, I, I don't think it's good to totally interrupt the service and call somebody out by name. That would be m impolite in my opinion. <laughs> but you might, hey, let's right. stand, sing a song. Let, let's pray. You know, if you, if you gotta break the sermon in half, once in a while I do that. And if you gotta stand up and half the congregation is asleep, please stop the sermon. Get them awake. It does not have to be that formal in all circumstances. It's better if they're awake and paying attention. That's good. That's helpful. Yeah, the idea of just calling somebody down, you're, you're putting your entire audience, everybody's going to feel the awkwardness of this oh, situation. Oh, yeah. That person's going to be incredibly embarrassed. Very embarrassed. It's going to make it, it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a huge risk. Um, okay. Someone was here, <laughs> that's a good way to say it. it's a huge risk. Uh, this is a book I've read sometime in the past, a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to vouch for it and say that everything was good. If I remember right, he had some things that were inappropriate and crude. But it was an interesting book because you've got a guy here who does this a completely secular book, nothing to do with preaching. But he does this professionally, and he talked about how he walks in a room, and he looks across the room, and he sees where people are sitting and how he deals with a huge audience in a small room or a huge audience, a huge room and a small audience. And what, you know, some of these problems he talks about technology, he talks about everything. It's a very, very practical book. It's a very interesting book and fun to read. But what I put that up there for is because I want to see uh, someone asked here about your book recommendations, any, not so much on the preaching side, we'll talk about preaching side, but just communication books or the philosophy of communication and so forth. Any thoughts? Well, first I would say that most communication books are the same because they're saying the same things that have been happening for 2,500 years since the Greeks. The only things that are new are American psychology and American sociology and maybe some politics. Um, so I would take all public speaking books with a grain of salt. You can learn things from them and they're each gonna have their own philosophic ideas. Um, 
I have a book from my class yesterday, if I can find it. Um, I hit it. Uh, can you Google crucial conversations and put Working up a on it. Got it. That? Crucial conversations is a really good book about interpersonal communication when there is conflict. A crucial conversation is when people have strong feelings, differing opinions, and the outcome actually matters. Okay? So it's good for interpersonal and it's good for public settings when there is a problem. The core idea of the book is that we need to develop shared meaning. In other words, we need to understand each other and we do that through dialogue. Now this doesn't happen in the pulpit, but Paul did, even in his writings, talk to his congregation back and forth. And you can see that he's answering questions that the congregation was naturally asking. And so we see that in Romans and in other books when Paul asks rhetorical questions or he gives answers to the hidden questions that are in the text. Um, Crucial Conversations is a secular book, but it, it does have a lot of good advice that even Christians would benefit from in terms of slowing down, listening to other people, allowing their thoughts to be heard, and then understanding those people without judging them. And you'll go a long way if you learn to listen, even with people you really disagree with. You meet a really strong secular atheist, you need to understand where they're coming from. You know that everything they're saying is probably going to lie, but you want to know how they think, and you want to know how the Bible reaches them, because if you don't know how they think, you're going to miss them. That's great. Part of the reason I think that we're missing it sometimes in our communication is we, because we don't actually know the people that we're talking to at all, and, and we're maybe insulated in a little silo of sub-Christian sub culture. So having those conversations is just opening yourself up to talk to somebody and listen is a really good starting point to know where to approach them. Um, use of humor in preaching? Very carefully. Uh, Jesus was called the man of sorrows. However, um, it doesn't mean that humanity is humorless or that everything is very, very serious because we are relating to each other and some people are naturally funny and some people are naturally serious. So I, I, I wouldn't look at jokes as the main way to relate to the audience, but gentle humor, humorous situations, I don't think that competes with the gospel. I think that builds the relationships. Great. Dr. Kielmeyer, thank you very much. And to all of you that sent questions across in chat, thank you. I think we covered as many of our, your questions as we could. Um, next time we have Dr. Menick coming. Please definitely, I'll talk about this more, but definitely take a look at the Moodle page. Pastor Denny gave us an excellent summary, I think, of the videos that I assigned. And so if you're interested, he did us all a service, really gave us good notes on that. I would encourage you, remember, if you're taking this class for credit, make sure you get through your homework and there's homework for each class. So we're definitely asking you to do that. Um, again, Dr. Kielmeyer, very enjoyable time. Thank you very much. This, is, this has been really fun. It's been a delight. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Excellent. Okay. We we'll look forward to a future lecture, and uh, we will see all of the rest of you on our next class on Friday. So thank you. Have a great day. Many blessings. God bless.